Flight crew awareness and vigilance are the primary tools that should be used to avoid CFIT. The problems associated with poor crew coordination and disorientation that were evident in the Rome, Georgia accident also contributed to another CFIT tragedy. As reported by the Transportation Safety Board of Canada, a Beechcraft C-99 departed Timmins, Ontario on the evening of April 20th, 1990. Two pilots and two passengers were on board the scheduled flight to Moosonee, Ontario. After an uneventful 38-minute flight via airways, the aircraft was cleared for the VOR runway 24 approach to Moosonee. After flying the procedure turn, the crew intercepted the 061 radial inbound and initiated a descent to the MDA of 440 feet. During the descent, the aircraft broke through the cloud layer at 900 feet MSL and approximately 9 miles from the airport. Since both pilots had the runway lights in sight, the captain decided to transition to a visual approach and proceed inbound to runway 24 at 700 feet MSL. Unfortunately, the aircraft's descent was never arrested. The aircraft impacted the ground at an elevation of 20 feet MSL, 7 miles east-northeast of the Moosonee Airport. The captain and passengers were seriously injured and the co-pilot was killed. After a thorough investigation, the Transportation Safety Board concluded that both pilots succumbed to a dangerous distortion of reality known as the black hole illusion. When a night approach is made over unlighted terrain, as was the case on this flight, the black area in the foreground causes the bright runway lights in the distance to appear lower than they really are. This gave the pilots the impression that they were higher than they really were. In fact, the captain later stated that he believed the aircraft was at an altitude of 700 feet MSL at the time of the impact. The captain also indicated that the last altitude call he received from the co-pilot was at 800 feet MSL, 100 feet above the intended level off altitude. With no help from the co-pilot, the captain continued to fly solely with visual reference to the runway lights. The lighting system at Moosonee was limited at best with no approach lighting and no visual approach slope indicator system. Research indicates that without cross-referencing the altimeter, the environment the pilots were operating in was one in which virtually no detectable rate of descent could be discerned through visual clues. The crew was further disadvantaged by the fact that the aircraft was not equipped with an altitude alerter, radio altimeter, or GPWS. Still, the primary defense should be situational awareness. Had the crew simply been more cognizant of their CFIT risk, they may have been more attentive to their altitude. Flight Safety Foundation CFIT checklist can be particularly helpful in identifying any deficiencies and potential risks in your operation. Something as simple as the area of the world in which you're flying can have a dramatic effect on your chances of being involved in a CFIT accident. For example, compared with North America, the CFIT accident rate is 33 times higher in the area in which our third accident occurred. On September 4, 1991, November 204 Charlie, a G-2 operated by a U.S. corporation, departed Tokyo, Japan for Jakarta with a planned fuel stop in Kotakinabalu, Malaysia. The crew had previous operational experience at the Kotakinabalu Airport, which is located on the northwest coast of Borneo. The en route portion of the flight is believed to have been uneventful. As the aircraft approached Kotakinabalu, the weather was VFR, with multiple cloud layers from 1,600 feet to 27,000 feet. Visibility at the airport was reported to be greater than 10 kilometers. The instrument approach facilities included an ILS and VOR, but no radar, which is typical of airports in the region. As the aircraft approached its clearance limit, the Kinabalu VOR, the crew repeatedly tried to obtain further clearance on the congested frequency. Ask if we can track outbound on the 258 if he wants to stop over the VOR. Yeah, 
The instructions to descend south of the airfield and maintain 9,500 feet are at best ambiguous. Although the VOR is not located on the field, its close proximity to the airport warrants including it in the clearance, especially in a non-radar environment. It's possible that the controller expected the crew to maintain VMC or for the aircraft to descend southwest over the water. If these were his expectations, he certainly did not clearly communicate them to the pilots. Since the controller and crew spoke different primary languages, the message received by the pilots may have been different than what ATC intended. It's believed the aircraft complied with the clearance and departed the Kinabalu VOR on a 180 degree track. As the aircraft progressed south, the controller continued to issue descent clearances. After obtaining limited visual contact with the ground, the crew became concerned with their proximity to the nearby terrain, which rose to 5,000 feet. As the crew turned to intercept the final approach course, they initiated a climbing turn. I'm going to turn to the right. God, I tell you. I don't like 
what we've got here. I'm climbing this sucker out of here. Unfortunately, the climb wasn't steep enough to clear the terrain, and the aircraft crashed only 100 feet below the top of a ridge located 32 miles south of the VOR. Among other things, accidents such as this exemplify the need to act as soon as possible on your intuition with a maximum performance climb should you become uncertain or have an uneasy feeling about the aircraft's position relative to the terrain. It could mean the difference between life and death. Although an escape maneuver is an effective means to avoid an accident and should be practiced regularly, it certainly would be preferable never to be in a situation where you actually have to use it. Let's take a look at a few things that may have helped this crew avoid the predicament in which they found themselves. One item that is always available is a thorough captain's briefing on the type approach to be flown. This discussion should include terrain information, which is available on the approach plate. Supplementing approach chart data with information from other sources can help enhance the mental picture of surrounding terrain. Several arrival routes from the southeast contained step-down restrictions for terrain clearance. In addition to SIDS and STARS, Pilots can review ONCs, WAX, sectionals, and airport qualification charts. The circumstances that this crew ran into are not unusual when pilots and controllers speak different primary languages. Any instance where the clearance doesn't fit the situation may be grounds for inquiry. Furthermore, since technology varies worldwide, you may encounter a wide range of ATC capabilities. Understanding the limitations of approach control radar and language differences in your area of operations is critical to flight safety. Another important factor to consider is approach design. Characteristics such as shallow approach angles have been cited as contributing factors in about 10% of CFIT accidents. For example, two aircraft recently crashed while on this approach into Kano, Nigeria, which has an approach angle of only 1.6 degrees. Flight crews should be especially alert on approaches with descent gradients less than 2 and 3 quarters degrees. Flight departments can use the CFIT checklist to help design policies, procedures, and training that directly addresses the CFIT threat. First, specific operational procedures should be established. Among the most important is to review the significant terrain along the route using a variety of charts. During the terminal phase, approach charts with color terrain contours and airport qualification charts can be of tremendous value. Also, it's a good policy to promote the use of ATC radar when available and emphasize the importance on the part of flight crews of knowing when they are not in radar contact. Of course, making full use of the pilot not flying for backup is essential, especially in the approach phase. Night and IMC approaches should be flown by the first officer if it doesn't conflict with established procedures. By monitoring the approach, the captain's experience can be used to quickly spot minor deviations before they become major problems. Where training is concerned, it's important to fight pilot complacency by highlighting the CFIT threat. This can be accomplished through analysis of recent and past CFIT accidents, as well as encouraging open discussion and establishing a non-punitive method of incident reporting and review. Additionally, to help reduce fatal hesitations, consider requesting your training provider to include terrain recovery practice annually in a simulator equipped with GPWS. However, to make it worthwhile, it's imperative to fly the way you train. Modern technology and equipment helps make the fight against CFIT easier. The benefits of GPWS are clear. But what can flight departments do if they don't have a GPWS installed? Well, think back to the fact that the primary cause of CFIT is a lack of situational awareness, and you may find some answers. For example, take full advantage of the equipment you do have, 
such as the radio altimeter. Also, use additional nav aids like GPS as a backup and to improve situational awareness. And as with any equipment, it's important that crews are educated on its benefits and limitations. While aircraft capabilities vary widely, the common thread in all CFIT accidents is the crew. The simple fact is that despite the millions of dollars spent each year on warning systems and safety devices, aircraft are still being flown into land or water without any forewarning on the part of the crew. CFIT won't just go away. Use the preventative techniques we've described as well as the Foundation's checklist to help maintain your awareness. Help is also available in the form of a CFIT training aid produced by Boeing in consultation with the Flight Safety Foundation. This training aid package contains a wealth of information and practical advice as well as guidance on how to incorporate CFIT training in your operation. Whatever your specific training methods are, remember that they need to focus on awareness and prevention. Start by recognizing the risk and your vulnerability. Then maintain your vigilance and keep up your training and proficiency. In the end, you, the crew, are the only ones who can ensure the safe completion of every flight. <laughs>